Hi, this is Martin Scrawley, and this is the third lesson on general chemistry. I, would, I think I should have a theme song or something that I can play now, but I don't. Um, instead, we're just going to do chemistry. Uh, this lesson is on stoichiometry. We're in chapter three of the Zumdahl and Zumdahl general chemistry book. Let's see here. Get my stylus working. We can get started. This is a very important chapter. Uh, it's amazing how quickly chemistry builds from extreme basics to extreme complexity. And that's uh, a lot of fun. So let's see. Chapter 3, stoichiometry. It's a funny word, isn't it? Stoichiometry. And this is pages uh, 781 to 137. That uh, sounds like a lot, 56 pages. It'll take us about an hour or two. So buckle up and uh, enjoy. So what the heck is stoichiometry anyway? Um, well, it's a study of the quantities consumed and produced in chemical reactions. So we're learning a little bit about chemicals in chapters one and two, chemical compounds, elements, molecules, things like that. And uh, the spoiler alert is that these molecules react with each other, as we know. Uh, and if you don't know, I'm telling you now, that uh, they react together to form new molecules and new chemicals. And the amounts in which they do that is something that we're very interested in in chemistry. Uh, and we call that stoichiometry. And so we're going to study all about stoichiometry. One of the basic things we're going to learn is, on a, is a section 3.1. We're going to call it counting by weighing. Counting by weighing. And we're on page... Uh, 82, and this is a Zumdahl. I think it's Stephen Susan Zumdahl. I think I got that right. Zumdahl and Zumdahl, ninth edition chemistry textbook. I encourage you to buy it. It's a great investment for a hundred bucks. You can gain an immense amount of knowledge. All right, counting by weighing. The book does this funny jelly bean experiment where they say you work at a jelly bean store, and occasionally you have customers that come in and say, "Well, I want ten jelly beans." And you, you poured out ten jelly beans. Okay. Here's 10 jelly beans, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That would be $1. Thank you very much. And then someone comes in and says, they say, 50. I want 50 jelly beans. I want to feed me and my friends. And you say, oh, God, you know, I have to do this again. One, two, three, four, five. And you do it, and it takes you a few minutes. But you weigh out, you, you, you count out the 10 jelly beans, presumably of gloves or something, so that your germs don't get all over it. I don't really believe in germs myself. But you kind of sit there and you do that. And you say, all right, all right. Here it is, here it is, almost done, almost done. All right, here's, I want that for $5. And then someone says, I want 5,000 jelly beans because I'm going to feed a whole party. And you say, all right, there's no way I can count out 5,000 jelly beans. So what do you do? What do you do? Well, it's pretty simple. What you want to do is you want to weigh the jelly beans. You want to weigh one jelly bean or 10 jelly beans. And if you weigh them and you determine, let's say, that they're five grams each, five grams each, and you wanted to do 5,000 jelly beans, it would simply be 25 kilograms. 25 kilograms. Five grams times 5,000 is 25,000 grams, which is 25 kilograms. Kilograms. So we're going to treat these jelly beans is identical. One jelly bean might be 5.0 grams, one might be 5.1 grams, one might be 4.9 grams. But if we average 10 jelly beans, we get roughly 5.0 grams. So we're going to assume each jelly bean is 5.0 grams. And we call that the average weight. And the average weight of a jelly bean is 5 grams. Even though there might be one that's 4.8 or 5.15, we're taking the average as 5.0 grams. And we're going to assume all 1,000 jelly beans, all 5,000 jelly beans. Are going to be are going to be uh, uh, five grams each, even though that we know there's some natural variation, and uh, that's sort of the concept of this average weight concept. And why do we do this silly jelly bean experiment uh, or uh, example? Well, we're going to go to section three point two, and we're going to talk about atomic masses, which is a little more serious, a little more serious than jelly beans. This is on page eighty three. And what, is, what are we doing here? Well, one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we look at atomic masses is that the way chemistry works is when, when we use the 12, the 12 carbon, this is the carbon that weighs 12 atomic mass units, it has six protons. This is the most common 
form of carbon. We're going to say that all uh, this will always equal 12 atomic mass units. So we sometimes call these Daltons. The book never uses this term, but we use this term a lot in organic and medicinal chemistry, so keep that in mind. So all of the other elements in, in the universe are in a relative mass to carbon. And we, we say that because there are 12 atomic weights, right, six protons, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then six neutrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, and these are, po I guess, six of them are positively charged and six of them are neutrally charged. Let's just assume it's like, it's like this, I guess. What, what's going on? All right, six, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Ne neutral, I guess I'll do equals. One, two, three, four, five, six. These each weigh one, right? Neutron weighs one, and a proton weighs one. So this will be 12 atomic mass units, 12. And all elements will be relative to the carbon 12. And, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So how do we weigh these things to begin with? Well. There's an important tool we're going to use, we're going to learn and use later, called the mass spectrometer. We're going to use this in organic and medicinal chemistry, and we're going to use it so much that I might actually bring you uh, to a mass spectrometer and periscope from there, or live stream from a mass spectrometer, and show you how it works exactly. It'll be a lot of fun to do that. Um, so anyway, a mass spectrometer can, can weigh samples very, very uh, carefully, and we're not going to go into the detail of how a mass spectrometer, mass spectrometer works, but it is very important. It can be extremely, extremely careful at weighing small things like atoms uh, and samples. So one of the things that we do when, when we look up the atomic weight, so we know that carbon-12, this is the 12-carbon 12, the 12 isotope, right? 12. It's, there's also the 13, and there's carbon-14, which we've discussed. These are all carbon isotopes. When we look up the average, when we look at the weight on the periodic table, which is on the first page of the textbook, it's the opening flap, the periodic table, we see, of course, we've got our hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, and then I'll blow up the carbon. It says carbon is the sixth element, and the atomic weight is 12.01. What? What does that mean? How could it be 12.01? I thought it was one proton. One is the weight of a proton, one is the weight of a neutron. There's 12 of these guys, six of each. That's 12, what's 12.01? Well, just like that we did with the jelly beans, there's actually a mix of different isotopes in naturally occurring carbon. Most of it, that's actually what, 99%, 98.9% of it is carbon 12, but 1.1% of it is carbon 13, almost none of it is carbon 14, almost none. It's like 0 0.001 or something. So you need to have the average, the weighted average, and the weighted average ends up being 12.01. So we're actually gonna use 12.01 for our average carbon weight in the future. You might find that interesting and annoying, but it's the way it is. There is some carbon 13 in the world, and there's certainly some carbon 14 as well. And so the average weight of carbon is 12.01. So that's interesting. That's the average atomic mass. So that's the way we're gonna do it. Remember, there's no carbon that weighs 12.01. It's either 12, 13, or 14, but there's just enough carbon-13 out there that it takes the average up to 12.01. So that's interesting enough. So let's, let's see. Let's go to the next section. And this is going to be one of the most important concepts. So if you don't understand it, please go backwards and watch it over and over again until you do. And we're going to talk about the mole. And no, we're not talking about a furry little critter, a furry little critter that looks like this. This is not the mole that we're talking about. These guys are pretty ugly, if you ask me. Maybe someone thinks moles are cute, but they look kind of, kind of like rats. Kind of disgusting. Look at that one. Oof. Pretty, pretty nasty fellow. That's not something I would want to run into. So it looks like you can bite your finger off. Anyway, the mole that we're going to discuss is very different. Um, the mole that we're discussing is actually the an amount, an amount. It's actually very similar. The best way I think of it is actually, it's similar to a dozen. When you deal, when you're, a, when you're a baker, you deal in dozens. You get orders for food, and you say, how many dozens do you want? And you never say, I want five, you say, I want, or six, you say, I want half a dozen. 
or a quarter of a dozen. And this is practical because that's roughly the amount, a dozen is 12 of something for anyone who doesn't know. That's, pra that's a practical amount for a baker. A baker never has to deal. If someone said, I want uh, 50,000 donuts, the baker would say, oh, I don't deal in that kind of amount. If you said, well, I want one tenth of one donut, Baker says, I don't deal in that amount either. I kind of deal in dozens. I, I'll sell you half a dozen. I'll sell you a whole, I'll sell you half a dozen. I'll sell you a whole dozen. I'll sell you two dozen. Right? This is roughly a comfortable amount, 12 of something, for a baker. Well, a mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd power. That is a big big number. And this is the number that chemists deal with. Because atoms are so small, we need a huge number. We need a huge number to be able to count, count them out. I want one mole of carbon. I want 10 moles of oxygen gas. This is a reasonable amount for us. This is the amount of atoms, or amount of anything. You can have a mole of donuts, but you wouldn't be able to eat them all. They'd be too many. You could have enough donuts for the entire planet. So, but in atoms, it makes a lot more sense since atoms are so small. So we call this number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which is your, I think we're gonna call this your second tattoo. What was our first tattoo? I forgot. You get, get this tattoo somewhere in your body. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Does anyone remember what was the first thing that we wanted tattooed? It was, it was a funny, these are the things that you just can't forget in chemistry. I think we had one in lesson two that was something that we just always needed to know. So this is, we call this Avogadro's number for what it's worth. Avogadro's number. And we, it's, it's in tribute to Avogadro, who was a great chemist. Now what, what did we say we were going to tattoo? What did we say we were going to tattoo? There was something really crucial in chapter 2, I think. And we said it is so important. Maybe it's was, maybe it was the law of conservation of mass. I don't remember. There was something. There was something that we said is so important that we need to always keep it in mind. But maybe I'll look back at the last class because that's what... That's what, uh, that's where I mentioned it. I kind of remember mentioning it. Maybe it was from lesson one. I don't really remember. It might have been lesson one. It might have been lesson one. Anyway, enough of that. Let's go back to uh, stoichiometry. So this is Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. I, I want you to get this right every time. I don't want you to say 6.1 times 10 to the 23rd or 6.02 times 10 to the 22nd, I see that quite often. Uh, that is also not uh, right. Is it so important that, of course, I remember it, but I want you all to remember it. So I, I, I certainly am going to flip through chapter 1 as well. What is it? What is it? I don't think I remember. I don't think I remember. Well, anyway, certainly your, either your first or second tattoo is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And I want you to remember that no matter what. Okay, so that's what a mole is. So, so one of the things that, uh, that's important about the mole, why did we pick this number? Why did we pick this number? And life is all about standards. And you're gonna see in, in organic chemistry, especially in medicinal chemistry, that we use standards a lot to validate, validate the rest of our work. And so one of the things that uh, is important about a mole is that 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of pure carbon-12 weighs exactly 12 grams. And why is this important? Because it actually gives us a unit factor. 12 grams is a reasonable weight. You could hold 12 grams in your hand. You could hold 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd of very much unless it was an atom-sized thing. You couldn't hold that many baseballs, or you can hold probably more than 6.02 times 10 to the, 10 to the third baseballs, 6,000 baseballs. Uh, so 6 times 
10 to the 23rd power is an enormous, enormous, enormous number. That's 23 more zeros. 23 more zeros. So that's a, a huge amount. Um, so let's, let's uh, focus in on this, everyone. So 12 grams is a reasonable kind of human weight. And what's cool is that you see that this is carbon 12. So it's 12 atomic mass units. 12 atomic mass units. I meant to make that a parentheses, not a C. Let's see, maybe we could do it again a little closer. So we've kind of equated, we've kind of equated um, a mass unit to a gram using this atom number. So let's actually do this conversion. And we'll kind of, kind of tell you something really kind of special here, that if you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms, Remember, there's 12 mass units in one atom of carbon. And cross these things out. And remember, this is all equal to 12 grams. We know that. So we'll actually say that this is sort of fascinating. We can divide both sides by 12. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd mass units is equal to one gram. So this, why is this interesting? It's because it, it tells us that if we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd mass units, or AMUs, or whatever you want to call them, Daltons, of any element, let's say it was oxygen, what would that be equal to in grams? Well, the atomic weight of oxygen is 16. So this many atomic mass units of oxygen would give us 16 grams, this many atoms of oxygen. So we know that this many of an atomic mass unit is one gram per 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd amount, or atomic mass units. So very interesting that we can get the grams very easily. So let's look to an example on page 87 here. And this will be our first kind of practical, very cool example. And if I'm going too fast, I'm going to go very slowly from this one because it'll really really sink in an important concept of chemistry, all right? So they are talking about an element called americium, which is a very rare element. In fact, it doesn't even occur naturally. You have to make it in a particle accelerator. So this is like a man-made element, and we're gonna see a few of these when we talk about nuclear chemistry, and it's not particularly relevant to our study, and especially since we're trying to aim for medicinal chemistry, but. The uh, americium is a, is a uh, man-made element, like I said, in a particle accelerator. It doesn't last very long, but let's assume that it behaves like a normal element. I don't like this one as an example, to be honest with you, but it is what it is. Page 87. And they're telling us that uh, uh, we can make it in very small amounts. So what we want to know is what is the mass? What is the mass in grams? of six atoms, six tiny little microscopic, not even microscopic, infinitesimally small atoms of americium. Well, the first thing I would do is look up americium, which is the symbol AM, look, look it up on the periodic table, there it is. It looks like it weighs 243, 243 atomic mass units, 243 units. So six of these guys, um, so let's see, six atoms. And we, we remember we want to be able to cross these things off. So the atoms is, is going to be, have to be below. It's going to have to be below the line, in other words, the denominator. We're going to say that it's 243 units per each atom, right? Each of those six atoms. So atoms cross out, and we're left with 1,460 so times 10 to the third units, or 1,460 units, so 1 1.46 times 10 to the third. 10 to the third is 1,000, right? So that makes sense. So now what? Well, we know that a mole of these units is equal to one gram. So this many units will have to convert. So let's do it real small over here. So we have 1.46 times 10 to the third units. And we want, so to cancel this out, we want units on the bottom, right? We want units on the bottom. 
So one gram is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd units. So we can actually cancel the units out. And if we multiply this by one, it just pops it in over here, right? So we have 1.46 times 10 to the third divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd grams. And if you know your algebra and pre-calculus and basic math, you know that you have to subtract these exponents. So the answer is going to be something like 10 to the negative 19th, right? 10 to the negative uh, 19th, or if you subtract them a little more accurately, be 10 to the what's 23 minus 3 is 10 to the 20th or 21st or 19th, depending on on the on the coefficients. And so the answer, if you calculate it out on a, like a TI calculator or something like that, is exactly 2.42 times 10 to the negative 21st. And this is a really small weight. You know, one gram is a small weight, let alone 10 to the negative 22nd grams. So this is a weight that is, is so small, and it makes sense because it's six atoms, right? It's only six atoms of something. Six atoms is, is a very small weight. We know that it takes a mole of atoms to even get into the gram territory, so that makes sense. All right, I hope you learned something on that. We're gonna do a bunch of examples in this chapter, so buckle up and get a scratch pad to learn all these examples. We're on page, page 88, we're gonna do some more, more examples. All right, they're talking to us about something called aluminum. We all know what aluminum is. So what they want us to do is, what is the number of moles? Number of moles of atoms and the number of atoms in 10 grams of aluminum. Well, the first thing that I would do is I go to the periodic table. Why would I do that? Well, it tells me that the atomic weight of aluminum is 26.98. And I immediately know, because of, of the, the mole standard, I know that one mole of aluminum weighs how much? One mole of aluminum weighs what? How many grams? 26.98 grams. And this already is giving, gonna give me enough ammo to solve this problem. Because they're asking me, well, you have 10 grams, right? You have 10 grams of aluminum. Well, I know that one mole is 27 grams. So I have 10 divided by 26.98 moles of aluminum. And if I divide that out, it's something like, uh, let's see here, it's something like 0 0.371 moles of aluminum. Now let's do this again with dimensional analysis, because I think this is wise. We have 10 grams of aluminum, and we have to multiply by some equality. We're going to put the grams on the bottom. We're going to put the grams on the bottom. Well, we know that 26.98 grams is equal to one mole of aluminum. So this is so this is grams per aluminum. We can cancel out grams per aluminum. So if you multiply 10 times 1, it actually becomes 10, and then the mole per the moles end up going over here. So this is the same thing as we just did before, except it's a little more, um, it's a little more sort of structured to do it with dimensional analysis. And I'd recommend you do it with the dimensional analysis technique, not do it in your head, because you will, you will screw it up if you do it in your head. Eventually, with these very big equations, it's better to do them with dimensional analysis. So how do we figure out how many atoms there are? They're asking us how many moles of atoms, and we got that. It's about 0.3 moles, 0.371 moles. Now, how many atoms in general? Again, we have to use dimensional analysis. And this is where keeping these big numbers in your head is pretty difficult. So we actually do it much easier with dimensional analysis. So 0.371 moles of aluminum. So we want to be able to cancel out moles of aluminum. So let's put, I don't know, one mole of aluminum down here. One mole of aluminum. How many atoms are in one mole of aluminum? Well, there's the same amount of atoms in one mole of anything. It's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So we can cancel this out. We can cancel this out. And then what's simple enough here, this atoms, right, kind of goes here. And this is the new unit factor, the new unit that the answer will be in. Multiply these two bad boys and we get an answer of two times 2.23 2 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. It's almost a mole, it's a third of a mole, so it makes sense that it's a third of Avogadro's number, right? But this would be a lot harder to do, I think, if, if you try to do it in your head as opposed to doing with dimensional analysis. 
All right, this is, we're actually breezing along here. Let's try page 89. Let's try page 89. All right, a silicon chip has a mass of 5.68 milligrams. That's a pretty small weight. How many silicon atoms are there? Okay, well again, we're gonna need the molecular weight of silicon, or the atomic weight of silicon. It's 28.09, which tells us that one mole one mole of silicon is equal to 28.09 grams. And we have five milligrams, that's a thousandth of a gram. So we really have, a, you know, maybe less than a thousandth of a mole. We would need 28 milligrams, right, to have a thousandth of a mole. So we have even less than a thousandth of a mole. So we need to, to calculate, um, we need to calculate um, how many atoms there are, okay? well. We know how many milligrams we have, so that's always going to be our starting point. The given. The given is milligrams of silicon. Okay? Now what should we do next? We want to convert this to grams of silicon. So we need milligrams of silicon on the bottom. 1,000 milligrams of silicon is equal to what? One gram of silicon. So these guys cancel out, and you're left with, this guy kind of goes to the side over here, and you're left with 5.68 divided by 1,000 grams of silicon. And if we reconvert this to uh, uh, scientific notation, we have to go backwards one, two, three times, or 0 0.00568, one, two, three. And then if we do that, one, two, three, it's 5.68 times 10 to the negative third. So we have 5.68 times 10 to the negative third grams of silicon. And now we have to convert this guy into atoms. Well, how do we do that? Again, we need on the bottom grams of silicon. So when one gram of, of silicon, or was it 28.09 grams of silicon? 28.09 grams of silicon is one mole of silicon. So again, we can cancel out grams of silicon. But what we're left with, and the moles will sort of come and become the new, we're only surviving unit, so it's gonna be the unit, we're representing here, and it's 5.68 times 10 to the negative third divided by 28.09. This is how many moles we've got of silicon. If we do the math here, this is going to go up to 10 to the negative fourth, right? Because we're dividing by this number. So you hammer out out in your calculator, and I guess we can get a TI calculator here. Get a, or maybe the Wolfram Alpha, Wolfram Alpha. 5.68 times 10 to the negative third times one uh, divided by 28.09. It's not doing us any favors, Wolfram Alpha. It's not doing us any favors. I want this in. Well, it is telling us it is 2.02. .02 and there's three, there's three zeros before the decimal point. So in scientific notation, right, this is, this is um, 2.02 times 10 to the negative fourth. So we have 2.02 .02 times 10 to the negative fourth. So that's doing us a favor. It's just not putting it in scientific notation, which would be nice. 2.02 .02 times 10 to the negative fourth moles of silicon. And you see, we've gone from We've done all these conversions. We've gone from milligrams, milligrams of silicon to grams of silicon. We went from grams of silicon to moles of silicon. And now where do we need to go? We need to go from one mole of silicon to atoms of silicon. We know how many atoms there are in a mole of silicon. There's always 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in a mole of anything. So moles per silicon cancel out. You multiply this very small number by this very big number, and that's how many atoms we have in the sample. And if you know how to multiply exponents, you know that we're going to end up adding these terms. And so the, the, it's going to be 12, or 1 point something, right? 1.22, 1 1.22 times, and if you add these up, it's going to be 10 to the 20th. That's how many atoms there are in that sample. And this is reasonably close 
This is close to like a thousandth of a mole, and that makes sense since if it were 26 grams or 28 grams, it'd be a, uh, a mole of silicon. So 28 milligrams is a thousandth of a mole, and this is about a thousandth of a mole. So this, this answer makes conceptual sense. We have to keep doing these because this is so important. This is so important. All right, cobalt. Cobalt is a cool little metal. It's a cool color. And uh, they're asking us to calculate this, both the number of moles in a sample of cobalt that has 5 times 10 to the 20th atoms. We all immediately, in your brain, you should say, well, hmm, that's less than a mole. That's less than a mole, isn't it? A mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. You can just look at your tattoo. Just look at your tattoo when it says that. So the number of moles, it's going to be less than one, right? And they want to tell us what the mass is. They want us to tell them what the mass is. Well, how much, uh, what's the molecular weight of cobalt, or the atomic weight of cobalt? It is 58.93. So that's one atom. So one mole of cobalt is equal to 58.93 grams. Grams. That's going to be helpful. But let's, let's take our given, because that's all we can do. We can start with the given. 5, point, 5 times 10 to the 20th atoms. So we are going to have to multiply that by something where the denominator has atoms. Well, we can do that. Let's see. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms is one mole of cobalt, right? Right? So if we can cancel out atoms, this sort of mole of cobalt is the new surviving unit. This just comes here because it's multiplied by 1, you know, a little algebra. So this equals 5 times 10 to the 20th divided by 6 Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd moles of cobalt. And let's, let's see what that is. Well, from alpha, 5 times 10 to the 20th divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. What do we get? It's 0. 0.0083, so it's 8.3 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4. 10 to the negative 4. 10 to the negative 4. Let's see. 8.3 times 10 to the negative 4. And what is this? This is moles of cobalt. So we already have the answer to the first part. This is how many moles of cobalt we have. We have a lot less than a mole of cobalt, and that made intuitive sense. We had less atoms than Avogadro's number. Now they wanted us to know the weight in mass. Now what we'll do is we'll say, well, we have to convert moles of cobalt. So I'm going to have to need I'm going to need moles of cobalt in the bottom here, right? And I'm going to need mass on the top. Well, one mole of cobalt is equal to 58.93 grams. So we're going to cancel moles of cobalt. We're going to multiply these two numbers. All over one means that we don't have to look at the one. So it's going to be this many grams. This times this. Well, again, let's go to, let's go here. So if we have 8.3 times 10 to the, to the negative fourth, 10 to the negative fourth times 58.93, we get 0 0.0489, or 0 0.0489 grams. If you wanted to convert this, you could say it's 4.89 grams to times 10 to the negative second, or 4.89 times 10 to the negative second grams. And that is the answer. All right, so that's enough calculating moles, but you know, you can do that for fun. You can do, you can find a million different uh, um, examples, and I encourage you to really master that. I wouldn't go forward in this course unless you really understood that, or you will be in big trouble and you will fail the course. So let's go to the next topic. This is page 90. Molar mass. Molar mass. Well, this is a lot like uh, the atomic mass, except we're going to do it in molecules. So good, good example of a molecule we're going to get to know really well in medicinal chemistry and, and uh, organic chemistry especially is methane. Methane. I think cows burp and fart methane. So it's CH4. It's a hydrocarbon. Keep that idea in the back of your head. Hydrocarbon. It's made of hydrogens and carbons. So 
the, the, we all know that carbon weighs 12 and hydrogen weighs 1, but there's four of them. So the, the atomic mass is going to be roughly 16. The carbon is like 12.01, so it's actually going to be 16.04. 16.04 grams. So one molecule of methane is 16.04 AMU. AMU, not grams, AMU. Well, what about a mole? Well, since a mole of carbon is 12.01 grams, and four moles of hydrogen is four grams, this, this actually is grams. So if you have one mole of methane, is 16.04 grams. So this is the molar weight, or molar mass of methane. Sometimes call it the molecular weight as well. So let's do some work. Work, 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 uh, as Rihanna would say, on molar mass. All right, we're on page 90 still. And they're telling us about a compound called juglone, which is a dye from walnuts and a herbicide. And the, the atomic, or the, the chemical formula for juglone, it's, a, it's an organic compound. It's C10H6O3. All right, well, carbon is 12.01. We've got 10 of them here. That's 120 that 120.1 grams or it's really what is it grams per mole isn't it for each mole that's the that's the weight in grams all right what about hydrogen hydrogen is just one times six is six grams per mole and how about oxygen oxygen 16 what's 16 times three i'm not very good at math it's 48 right that's 48 grams per mole so in total the molar or atomic or molecular weight not atomic, but molar mass or molecular mass is, let's do this, 174.1 grams per mole. I guess I could have just looked at the book. And they're asking us, what is the molar mass of juggle? And wow, we got that. That was easy. Now they're asking us, they have a sample of 1.56 times 10 to the negative second grams of pure juggle. How many moles? How many moles is that? Well, this should be easy peasy. And again, dimensional analysis gives us the answer because we know our given. We can't really avoid the given. We just have to convert it. This is grams of, of C10H, oops, C10H6O3, C10H6O3. And we have to multiply by something well, the bottom has to be grams of C10H6O3, or otherwise we can't cancel it out. But we know that one mole is equal to 174. One mole of this stuff. Let's put it over here. One mole of C10H6O3 is equal to 174.1 grams of C10H6O3. So we're going to cancel out the like term. We can cancel out the 1, and this guy will come up over here. And what is that? 1.56 times 10 to the negative second divided by 174.1. And this is how many moles, that's how many moles there is. So we're basically done. We just need to get the calculator out. 1.56 times 10 to the negative, uh, negative second divided by 174.1. We get the answer. 0.000089. This is, is 8.9 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 to the negative fifth moles. That's how many moles we've got. Does the book think I'm right? Of course, because dimensional analysis will never steer you wrong, even on these complicated questions. Even on these complicated questions. So this is really an awesome way to do things. All right, what's next? What's next? Calcium carbonate. This is the stuff that's in chalk. Calcium carbonate is a very important little molecule. So you gotta know calcium carbonate, CaCO3. CaCO3. Calcium carbonate. We need the molar mass. That's the first thing they wanna know. What's the molar mass? The second thing they wanna know. We have a sample of 4.86 moles of calcium carbonate. What is the mass? And then what is the mass of the CO3 2 minus ion in grams? 
Okay, so calcium, we have one calcium, we've got one carbon, and we've got three oxygens, right? We know this is going to be 12.01, this is going to be 16.00, and calcium we can just flip to the periodic table, and it's 40.08. 40.08. So if we add all this up, 12.01, 48, 40.08, this is 9, 0, 0, 100.09 grams per mole. Easy peasy. So that's the molar weight. Let's do it in green, I think. 100.09 grams per mole. That's the molar mass. Okay, so we have 4.86 moles of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate. So we need to multiply this by something say moles of calcium carbonate, let's just say it's one, and we, we're trying to get uh, the mass in grams, so we know that the molar mass, 100.09 grams of calcium carbonate is equal to one mole of calcium carbonate. You can think of these as, this is an equality, like one over one. You can multiply anything by one and it's still the same thing. That's how we convert, so moles of calcium carbonate cancel with moles of calcium carbonate and we're left with we're left with what exactly 486 roughly grams of calcium carbonate that's 4.86 moles if each mole weighs about 100 and we've got about 5 moles it makes sense that we've got about 500 grams of calcium carbonate now what about the calcium uh, this carbonate ion CO3 ion well we just take the CO3 ion we see that the weight of the CO3 ion is 60.01 grams per mole, 60.01 grams per mole, and the calcium ion, the Ca2+, plus, this is the CO3 2 minus, Ca2 plus ion is 40.08 grams per mole. So we want to understand how many, what is the mass of the ions we've got? Well, this is pretty simple. Uh, this is pretty simple, I would say. We have 4.86 moles of that ion, don't we? We have 4.86 moles of the CO3 uh, 2 minus ion. And we need to multiply that by this, one mole of CO3 2 minus, the molar weight, which is what, 60.01 grams, grams of carbonate ion. This cancels with this, and we get the product of these two in grams, which is what? Just to do it in your head, it's 290 something, right? 292, according to the book, grams of CO3 2 minus. So this was pretty easy and a lot of fun. We're almost, uh, we're going pretty slowly here because this is so important, but uh, we'll, we'll get there, trust me. This is so important that I don't think, I, I think when I did this chapter once, we kind of skipped through it too quickly and I, it wasn't a good idea. All right, isopentyl acetate. What the heck is that? What the heck is that? Isopentyl acetate. It is a compound responsible for the scent of bananas. Bananas. It's C7H14O2. I like bananas and I like turtles. All right, bees release one microgram. Microgram is one times 10 to the negative sixth of a gram. Bees release this much isopentyl acetate when they sting, and it other bees join in the attack. So how many molecules are released in a bee sting? In a bee sting, all right, well, let's set this up again. C is 12.01, we've got seven of these bad boys. H is 14, uh, excuse me, we got, H is one, we got 14 of them. That way I can write down right now is 14.00. Oxygen is 16, we've got two, so that's 32.00. This is the part I dreaded. This is uh, 70 and 14 is 84, right? 84, 84.07. So this is uh, 8, 10, 0, uh, 9, 12, 130.07, right? Well, hydrogen they're saying is point. 1.008, that's kind of annoying. So hydrogen ends up being 
why can't they just make hydrogen one? It's because they're isotopes of hydrogen, I guess. So it's 130.18 grams per mole. That's the molar mass of isopental acetate. Now the rest is easy. We've got one times 10 to the negative sixth grams of C7H14O2. And we know that 130.18 grams of C7H14O2 is in what? One mole. Well, we got this, we got this upside down, right? It's not going to cancel unless we do it the other way around. Where is it? Let's see. Let's slow down. We're going too fast. Blazing speed here. Let's start over. Let's get our head clear. This is the given. We've got one microgram of this stuff. We need this grams of this stuff to be on the bottom. C7H14O2. And we need 130.18 grams of this stuff to equal one mole, right? One mole of this stuff. Sometimes you go too fast, you can confuse yourself, right? So, of course, these cancel out. This guy just hops over here, so I can literally just put it in. And this is how many moles that the bees release when they sting. 1 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by 130. Now if you divide a negative number by a much bigger negative number, we're going to get a, a more negative number. And the answer here is 8 times 10 to the negative 9th moles. Do that in Wolfram Alpha if you'd like to double check of C7H14O2. So what is the question they had? They wanted to know how many molecules are present in a bee sting and how many atoms of carbon. How many molecules in a bee sting? How many molecules in a bee sting? And how many atoms of carbon? That's kind of an annoying question. How many atoms of carbon? All right. Well, we have the number of moles in a bee sting. So we're going to have 8.10 to the negative moles of C7H14O2. So now we need moles, one mole in the bottom, C7H14O2. And of course, we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd uh, molecules, molecules in one mole of this stuff. So if we cancel out the, mo the moles on the bottom, and you can get rid of the one as well, that's not going to do you any good. You multiply a very small number by a very large number, you end up adding the exponents. So it's going to be 4.8 4 times 10 to the, let's see what the book says, 4.8 4 times 10 to the 15th, times 10 to the 15th molecules. That is how many molecules are in a bee sting. Now, how many carbon atoms are there? This is a trick. This is kind of a trick question. This is kind of a trick question. This is how many molecules, how many atoms of carbon? Well, we know that there's 4.8, 4.8 times 10 to the 15th molecules of isopental acetate, right, in a bee sting. So that means, remember, in each molecule of, of isopental acetate, there are seven carbons. So if we multiply by seven, well, seven times five is about 35, right? So 3.5 times 10 to the 16th carbon atoms. Kind of a trick question, but pretty easy. All right, so that's enough on that. 3.5 we're going to skip. 3.5 is called learning to solve problems. I am teaching you how to do that, so I don't think you need to read it. But if you have the book, feel free to read it. I don't think there's anything in there that is worth reading uh, that you're not going to pick up just listening or reading any math class or science class or any, any kind of uh, logic or philosophy class. So I think 3.5 you can skip. 3.6 is called percent composition of compounds.
this is going to be pretty easy. We're, we're done with the hard stuff, I'd say. Percent composition of compounds. The rest of this chapter is easy stuff. We're going to glide through it, I'm telling you. <clears throat> Maybe take a quick water break. All right, we're back. So let's consider ethanol, which I will be drinking later tonight when I watch the MMA fight. Ethanol is uh, C2H5OH. It is the second hydrocarbon alcohol after methanol. We'll talk about all about this stuff in organic chemistry. So. The weight is, of course, C is 12, H, we have six H's, keep that in mind, and then O, we've got one O, so this is 24 and 6 and 12 is 42. Uh, you got that right? Oxygen is 16. I knew something was wrong here. It's 46, 46 grams per mole. Okay, so that's one, one mole of ethanol is 46 grams. Maybe I'll drink a mole of ethanol tonight. I think I'd die if I drank a mole of ethanol, would I? Well, it sounds like a lot. Maybe not. So the mass percent is another way to think of this. Mass percent. If you look at the mass, mass percent of ethanol, carbon is what? Carbon is about 52%. Hydrogen is 13%, and oxygen is 34%. That's what we'll call the mass percent. The mass percent, which makes sense. Very intuitive, very easy. Like I said, this is quite easy. So let's skip their first question. So how about determining, 3.7, determining the formula of a compound. This is, this is a little trickier. We're going to introduce ourselves to reactions as well. We're on page 96, so we're almost done with this chapter. Not quite done, maybe another half hour. All right. Suppose we, we had a mad scientist named Akil, and he, he made a substance that's composed of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. There's three elements. Mad scientist Akil. And when one, uh, 0.1156 grams of this compound is reacted with oxygen, 0. 0.1638 grams of carbon dioxide and 0 0.1676 grams of water are collected. Assuming that all the carbon in this compound is converted to carbon dioxide, we can determine the mass of the carbon originally present in the 0 0.1156 gram sample of the unknown compound. Sure, that's pretty easy. Carbon dioxide is CO2, so there's C and O. There's one C, two O's. C is weighs 12, O weighs 16. So carbon dioxide is 12 plus 32, or 44 grams per mole, right? We have uh, this much carbon dioxide. So 0 0.1638, and we're, they're telling us that all of the carbon in our mysterious unknown compound was converted, was moved into this carbon dioxide. All right, so we have 0 0.638 grams of carbon dioxide. And so we can tell, what are we trying to tell? Well, we can tell how many moles of carbon dioxide we had, right? And we know the mass percent carbon is 12 out of 44 
Carbon is 12 out of 44 in carbon dioxide. So mass percentage is what? 38.67%. Is that right? 12 divided by 44? 12 divided by 44 is 27%. Hold on a second. So we can take the weight of the carbon dioxide and multiply it by that, right? 27.27%. And we get 0 0.0447. 0 0.0447 grams of this sample of carbon dioxide is actually carbon. And so if we divide this over the sample weight, 0.638 grams of this, uh, well, we can divide it over the original sample. We don't want to, we know how much it is over a carbon dioxide, but how about the mystery sample? Mystery sample. We can see by the weight of Carbon in the mystery sample is 38%. That's where that 38% came from. And I hope this makes sense to you. Let's retrace our steps real quick. They told us there's a mystery compound of 0 0.1156 grams, and it contains some amount of carbon, some amount of hydrogen, some amount of nitrogen. All of the carbon in the mystery compound was converted into carbon dioxide all of it. So we can tell how much carbon is in this carbon dioxide because we know that 12 out of every 44 in carbon dioxide is carbon. So about a fourth, about a fourth of this sample is the original carbon that was in the mystery compound. So carbon accounts for 38.6% of the mystery compound. Cool. So we can do the same thing with, uh, with, with the rest of the samples. All of the hydrogen in the mystery compound was converted into the water. Interesting. Well, water is 18, right? Two hydrogens, one oxygen, which is 16. So water is, is uh, hydrogen is 2 divided by 18 parts of, of water. 2 divided by 18. Hydrogen is 1 ninth of water. And how much water do we have? We have 0.6. 0.1676 grams of water. We multiply that by 2 over 18. We get 0 0.0186 grams. Of hydrogen are in the water. And were originally in the mystery sample. So if we divide this amount by the mystery sample, which we just did with carbon, we get 16%, 16.2%. Let's do that math. 86 divided by 0.1156, about 16%. So we know that if the original compound had just carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and it's this much carbon and this much hydrogen, the rest has to be nitrogen. So that's pretty easy. 16.2 plus 38.6. Minus 100 is 45.2, 45.2% nitrogen. Let's assume we have 100 grams of each. 45.2 grams of nitrogen, 38.6 grams of carbon, and 16.2 grams of hydrogen. Well, then we have to do the molar conversion. The molar weight, each one is, is different, right? Nitrogen weighs 14, hydrogen weighs 1, carbon weighs 12. So if we divide all of these, what we end up getting, let's do 45.2 divided by 14, it's about 3.2 moles. Because one mole of nitrogen weighs 14 grams. So we have 45 grams, so it's about 3.2 moles. How about carbon? 
38.6 divided by 12 is also 3.2 moles. How about hydrogen? 16.2 divided by 1 is 16. 16 moles. We have 16 moles. This is interesting. We have 16, 3.2, and 3.2. So we know the formula of this mystery compound is going to be in this ratio. And this is the law of multiple proportions. Compounds will be in whole numbers, if you remember from chapter one. will often be in these easy to add up and divide and subtract whole numbers. So is this easy to add up and subtract and divide? Yeah, because carbon, there's one atom of carbon for every atom of nitrogen. And for hydrogen, there's what, four? Is that right? five? Let me do this division. It's about five. It's about five hydrogens for every carbon and nitrogen. So the formula of this mystery compound is CNH5, or CH5N. That's what we're going to call, it may not be the final formula, right? Because this could be, this compound could be CH5N, or it could be, theoretically, it could be C2H10N2. Or it could be C3H15N3 be any of those things. And we call this, we call this the basic formula from when we arrive at all this, we call this the empirical formula. Empirical formula. CH5N. We should really write it the other way. CH5N. But it could also be C2H10N2 or c 3 h 15 we can't determine this, we can't really determine this without knowing the molecular weight. It could be any of these things. You could determine it using different kinds of experiments, right? Let's do one kind of advanced problem. We'll zip through the chapter on page 100. They say, they say we have a white powder. I have a friend named Billy that knows a lot about white powders. It's a white powder and it has 43.64 percent phosphorus and 56 equals 100, right? 56. 36% oxygen. The molar mass of the compound is 283.88 grams per mole. What is the empirical formula? And what is the molecular formula? Well, we immediately know Oxygen weighs 16. We put that in the back of our head, right? Each atom of oxygen is 16 mass units, and one mole of oxygen is 16 grams. How about phosphorus? I don't know a lot about phosphorus. It's 30.97. So I scrawled that 16 pretty poorly here, so erase it. 16.00. All right. So how do we get started? Well, we know this thing's slightly more oxygen than phosphorus, right? But how do we... How do we get that squared away? Well, let's see. Maybe we can, maybe we can see how much 100 grams of this stuff. Let's say we had 100 grams of this stuff. It would be 43.64 grams of it would be phosphorus. And we know that one mole of phosphorus would be 40, would be what, 30.97 grams. So grams of phosphorus cancels out. And this is 43.64 moles of phosphorus over... Four, 43 over 30 is how many moles of phosphorus there are in 100 grams. 100 grams of this mysterious compound, which we know is some kind of PO combination. We just don't know how much. Okay. So the answer is 1.409 moles of phosphorus in a 100 gram compound, or a 100 gram compound. Let's do the same thing here. 
and 100 gram compound, 56.36 grams of it will be oxygen. We have the same idea, one mole of oxygen is 16 uh, grams of oxygen. So 58, 56.36 divided by 16 is how many moles of oxygen would be in this. So 3.523 moles of oxygen. Now, if in this 100 gram sample, we have 3.5 moles of oxygen to 1.409 moles of phosphorus. Is that a ratio? Is that a, a basic ratio? Let's add it up. Oh wow, it's equal to almost exactly 2.5. 2.5. So there's 2.5 moles of oxygen for every one mole of phosphorus. So the formula is probably something like this. O, what, O5, P2, or P2O5 more likely is where we would write it. P2O5, that's the empirical formula. This is the empirical formula. Well, what is the weight of P2? It's, well, let's see, 30, 31 plus 31 plus 16 times 5. Well, I could just do 16 five times, not too hard. Is 142. Well, we know that the molar weight is actually 284, which is double 142. So the real formula is P4O10. That is our mystery compound, P4O10. Pretty cool, huh? That was fun. All right, let's skip ahead to 3.8. And we're going to introduce ourselves to chemical reactions, which we'll be doing for the rest of the class, chemical equations. All right, when, when we do a chemical change, chemical change, a chemical change, what are we doing? We're, we're actually reorganizing, right? Reorganizing. We're reorganizing atoms. A good example is that good old methane that we talked about. We take methane and we burn it with oxygen. And we're going to get carbon dioxide and water. This is a chemical reaction. It's a chemical change. This is a chemical equation. This is a chemical equation. We're going to see a lot of these. And these guys here, the starting materials, we're actually going to have a name for these. We're going to call them reactants. Reactants. And the final, the final result, we have a name for it called products. It's the product of the reaction. These are products. Reactants, methane and oxygen, products, carbon dioxide and water. Very simple. The bonds have been broken. The C with the hydrogen, you can see that they break these bonds. It's almost like snapping them. You can think of them as snapping those bonds. Crack, crack. And these O2 bonds, this bond that holds O, o, o together, they break that bond too. And then they rearrange them to form the carbon dioxide and the, the, the water bond. Pretty crazy, huh? So it's like Legos. They kind of crack the bonds open uh, or, and rearrange them. So remember our first law of conservation of mass. There has to be the same number on both sides of the atom, uh, on both sides of the equation, same number of, of mass, law of conservation of mass. So we have to balance this equation. There's one carbon on this side, and there's one carbon on this side. Well, there's four hydrogens here, and there's only two hydrogens here. And we know we can't just create mass out of thin air. So CH4 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. So we have to balance this ourselves. Well, there's plenty, we, have, we can assume there's plenty of these molecules lying around. It's not like we have a limitation. So we can balance this equation. So if we, we need two H2Os, 
And now we have to add it up. How about left side, right side? Let's just do it like this. Well, let's see, carbon. We've got well, one on the left side. We've got one on the right side. How about hydrogen? We have four on the left side. We've got four on the right side. How about oxygen? Well, we've got two on the left side and two, three on the right side. So the oxygen is in balance. So we need to rebalance this one more time. How do we do that? How do we do that? All right, what if we made, what if we made, hmm, hmm, two oxygens here? Two oxygens here. We actually have four over here, so two here and two here, right? Two H2Os means two O's, and one carbon dioxide is four. So we have four on the right side, actually. Four on the right side. So we just add two oxygens, we'll have four on both. And this was the balanced equation. One molecule of methane plus two molecules of oxygen gas gives us one molecule of carbon dioxide and two molecules of water. Very easy. Very easy peasy. So we also do this kind of neat physical state description in, in chemical equations where if you have a solid, we're just going to abbreviate it with an apostrophe, uh, a parenthesis with an S. Same thing with liquid, same thing with gas. And then we have this little thing called AQ, which is uh, something that's dissolved in water, an aqueous solution. So keep that in mind when we do these. So here's, here's an example. Here's hydrochloric acid, which is always, almost always going to be an aqueous solution. It could be a gas, I guess. And we're going to add it to this sodium bicarbonate, I guess. And this will yield, that's a solid, that's a powder. This will yield carbon dioxide gas, water as a liquid, and salt as an aqueous, dissolved in an aqueous solution. So that's how we kind of describe, describe this stuff. Very important. You're going to see that often. All right. So balancing equations is pretty simple. It's pretty simple. I don't think we need to go through that too carefully. I think we are smart enough to balance equations. So let's start to close out the chapter with 3.10. Stoichiometric, love that word, stoichiometric calculations. All right, here's a tough problem. What mass What mass of oxygen will react with 96.1 grams of propane? Well, propane is C3H8. Oxygen is O2 and will yield carbon dioxide and water. This is a combustion reaction, it's very typical. This is water as a gas, carbon dioxide, of course, is a gas, oxygen always, almost always a gas, and propane as a gas. So this is balanced, right? We've got C, three carbons here, three carbons here, we've got eight hydrogens here, eight hydrogens here, oops. We've got 10 oxygens here, and six plus four is 10 over here. All right, so we know that uh, propane is gonna be what C3, is three times 12 is 36, and eight makes 41, uh, 44, 44. Is that right? Yeah, 44. All right, so we have 96.1 grams of propane. 96.1 grams of propane. And we know that one mole is 40, what do we say, 44, right? Three times 12 is 36 plus 8 is is 44. 36 plus 8 is 44, yep. Propane. Cancel this out, oops. Grams per propane, grams per propane. Come over here, 96.1 grams, 96.1 divided by 44 moles of propane is how many moles of propane we have. It's a little over two, right? It's gonna be 2.18 moles of propane. All right, now we need to 
figure out how, what is the mass of oxygen, what is the mass of oxygen that will react with that. Well, we know it takes five moles, five moles of oxygen to react with one mole of propane. We know how many moles of propane we have. So we can multiply this. 2.18 moles of propane. And of course, I set this up so that they could cancel. And we'll know that the, amount, the moles of oxygen will be 10. It's 10 odd moles of oxygen. 10.9 moles of oxygen. And we're almost done. This is easy because we know a mole of oxygen gas is 32. A mole of oxygen monoatomic oxygen is 16. So a mole of oxygen gas is 32. And so 10 moles, 10.9 moles of something that weighs 32 is going to be 349 grams. And that is the answer. If you need help with that last one, I mean, it's a simple dimensional analysis step, right? 10.9 moles of O2. Let's see, 32 grams per one mole of O2. Cancels, cancels, 349 grams. Pretty easy stuff. All right, are we done? Should I bore you some more? Let's do one last section. Hey, Jamie, one last section. Maybe I'll play a League of Legends game after this. The concept of the limiting reactant. All right, let's say you work at a sandwich shop and you have two slices of bread you need to, for a sandwich, right? And you need three slices of meat. You can't do anything less or more. Three slices of meat. I don't know why it's exactly three, but that's the best recipe. And then one slice of cheese gives you a sandwich. Sandwich, I always spell sandwich wrong. And let's say you had in your inventory eight bread, nine meat, and five cheese. Which is the limiting reactant? Which limits you, limits you from being able to make sandwiches? How much do you? What, what do you have the least of? Well, you have enough for four. You have enough for a uh, bread for four sandwiches. You have enough meat for three sandwiches. You have cheese for five sandwiches. So definitely the meat. You need more meat. Meat is the limiting reactant. Well, let's say you had, uh, let's say you had a reaction of nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas to form ammonia. A lovely little reaction. Let's say you had 15 molecules. I'm just going to deal with molecules. 15 molecules of hydrogen and five molecules of nitrogen. How many ammonias could you make? Well, if I had 15 and I had five, I could make, I don't know, let's see, how much could I make? How much could I make? Does anyone know? One to three. No, it's at five to fifteen. Maybe five to fifteen. Five nitrogen. Fifteen hydrogen. I'd be able to make ten ammonia, right? Ten ammonia. Ten ammonia. And this is I'd have. Which one is limiting? Well, they'd all be used up at the same time. And this is what we'll call a stoichiometric mixture. when it's the exact match of reactants you need to make the product, and so that it's balanced. So we're going to do some problems, and we'll do one, I guess we'll do one problem to end, end the chapter. And it'll, be, it'll be a doozy. Almost done. And I'm on page 119. Nitrogen gas, nitrogen gas can be prepared by passing gaseous ammonia, NH3, the gas, 
over something called copper oxide. Copper 2 oxide, I guess. Copper 2 oxide. At high temperatures. We get nitrogen, we get copper, we get water. All right. If we have a sample of 18.1 grams of ammonia and 90.4 grams of copper oxide, what is the limiting reactant? And how many grams of nitrogen will be formed? Those are our two questions. So this is really a really practical question. Right? This is not, we're not playing around anymore. This is a really practical question. All right, so let's do the math. We have 18.1 grams of ammonia. So we're going to need grams, we I mean one mole of ammonia. You know what's going to happen here. One mole of ammonia is equal to what? How many grams? Well, N is... Uh, N is 14, and H is 1, so it's 15, right? 15. 15, one mole of ammonia is 15 grams of ammonia. 15 grams of ammonia. So grams per ammonia cancel out, and we're left with 18.1 over 15 moles of ammonia. Less than, less than one mole of ammonia, right? page here. Yeah, it's 1.06. I, I don't want to do the calculation myself. 1.06 moles of ammonia. All right, let's do the same thing with the copper oxide. We have 90.4 grams of copper 2 oxide. And how many grams of copper 2 oxide is in one mole of copper 2? to oxide, and that's just going to be 16 plus the weight of copper, and copper is 63. Copper is 63, so 63 plus 16 is 79. It's actually 79.5 if you do it exactly. So copper oxide grams cancel out. This one disappears, 90.4 over 79.5 moles of copper oxide. So we have 1.14 moles of copper oxide. So look at that. We've got more moles of copper oxide than we do of ammonia. And we need one mole of ammonia and one mole of copper oxide to do this reaction. So who's the limiting reactant? We have less, right? We have less ammonia. Oh, well, we haven't balanced this equation. Well, hold on, hold on. We assumed that it was one to one. But hold on, maybe we maybe it's not one to one. Let's make sure our equations are balanced. That's a good thing to do, right? Well, we have one n on the left and two n's on the right. Uh oh, so we need to have two here. All right now we have two n's and two n's, but what about h's? We've got six h's here and only two h's here, so we need three waters. All right. So let's see. Do we still balance with the nitrogens? Yeah, two and two. How about hydrogens? Six and six. Okay. How about copper? One and one, fine. Now just oxygen. We have one here and three here. Huh, so we have three here. And maybe just put the three here. So let's just triple check. Nitrogens, we've got two and two. Check. Hydrogens, we've got six and six. Check. Copper, we've got three and three. Check. How about oxygen? We've got... Uh, Three, and three. Check. Cool. All right. So it turns out that we need two for every two ammonias. We need three coppers. So we actually three copper over two ammonia. Three copper over two ammonia. So for one point oh six moles of ammonia. We need 1.59 
moles of copper oxide. That makes sense. It's sort of like 3 to 2 ratio. So a 3 to 2 ratio, if the 2 is 1.06 moles, the 3 ratio will be 1.5 something. So we need 1.59 moles of copper oxide. We don't have that many moles of copper oxide. We have too much ammonium and not enough copper oxide. So the limiting reactant is actually copper oxide. So all of this copper oxide will be converted and we'll have extra ammonia left over. Let's rewrite this equation. 2NH3 plus 3CuO. And let me just write the amounts in the top. We have 1.59 moles of this stuff and 1.14 moles of that stuff. And the reaction, we got the other way around. We have 1.06 moles. 1.06 moles of ammonia and 1.14 moles of copper oxide. And this yields one molecule of N2, which is what we're worried about. And what did they ask us? What is the limiting reactant? Well, we know it's the copper oxide. Now, how much N2 are we going to end up making? Well, it's interesting. We can actually, I don't know how many calculations we actually need to do here. It's, it's kind of interesting, right? We know that we're going to make, for every two moles of this stuff, for every three moles of this stuff, we make one mole of this stuff. And this, this is the limiting reactant. So we're going to divide 1.14 moles divided by 3. And we, so we basically know we're going to make 0 0.38 moles of nitrogen gas. This is the limiting reactant. So all 1.14 moles of copper oxide will be used. And for 3 moles of copper oxide, we're going to need 2 moles of, of ammonia. We've got plenty of that. And it'll create 1 mole of nitrogen. All right. Cool. So we are done with this chapter. Um, I encourage you to study it over and over again just because it's we go through a lot and uh, it's going to be really, really important. Uh, copper oxide is definitely the limiting reactant, not ammonia. Remember the molar ratio here and that'll, that'll tell you um, something, I guess. Um, and we'll see you next time on chapter four where we're gonna go through, uh, I'll give you a quick preview, we're gonna go through more reactions and solution stoichiometry. That's chapter four, we'll probably do that uh, some point tomorrow. So thank you so much, have a great day.